These questions and answers were recorded as part of the Creating Accessible Content with Office 365 webinar. We would like to open it up for questions now. Uh, James, do we have any questions in, in the Q&A? Yes, we yes, sure do. Sure. We have a few uh, questions. Our first question, do all screen readers sound, a, sound like this? That is a very good question. And uh, it really depends on what brand of screen readers you have. Uh, so there are many different types uh, such as JAWS and NVDA. And I know in both of those, uh, you can actually choose what, um, uh, what voice you want to, to have. So you can choose a female voice, you can use a male voice, you can, uh, you can even have uh, someone with a, a British or a Scottish accent, or there's, there's all different kinds of voices that you can choose. Uh, the one that was shown in the demo is, is the default, and uh, those are the ones that you will generally hear if you don't change those settings. And Abby, if you could also elaborate on the user's ability to choose the speed of the speech. Yes, absolutely. Um, just like the voice setting, you can, uh, as James said, make the the, the speed, the, the tempo go slower or faster, uh, whatever you um, uh, is your comfort level. So a very uh, skilled uh, screen reader user what may like to have the speed turned up really fast because they're used to hearing that and can pick out um, pick out keywords, especially when they're going through through those headings, and and then they can slow that tempo down to uh, in case it's very complex document that they're reading. So, uh, so again, if you if you hear a screen reader or someone using a screen reader, you may you may notice that change in tempo, voice, uh, volume things like that. There's a lot of different settings that you can you can use. And and Jonathan will talk a lot more about screen readers in the next uh, section of the presentation. Hey, excellent. We have another question for you. Does the majority of screen reading software accurately read two columns? That is a question that I would like to defer to Jonathan. He is our screen reader expert. Um, but it, de it depends on how the document is set up. The screen readers are to, um, if you use your columns icon or feature functionality in Office 365, uh, then it, it should read the columns appropriately. Um, if you use text formatting to create your own columns, then it might not read those accurately because you did not use the built-in functionality of the um, the column, creating columns. So again, uh, thank you for your question, and I'm I'm sure that's something that Jonathan will will also go over with the live demonstration. Thank you for that, Abby. Just I want to just add something there. We want and we will definitely defer this question to Jonathan. He can yeah. elaborate more during his section. But I do want to note that the what we're trying to do is help to make accessible documents. A screen reader is not going to be able to do anything that uh, we have not put in for as accessibility features within our presentations. So that's going to be critical to if it can read the two columns or not. But again, we'll we'll let John Johnson's going to go over that more thoroughly during his presentation. All right, we have another question and it said the question is sometimes when sharing information with an audience, you may need to provide technical information specific to the audience. Do you have any advice when sharing this technical information? How to share the information and still try to present in a simple manner? Yes, absolutely. And uh, for instance, in, in my presentation, I described each of the images that were on the slides, uh, and that is an accessibility feature in presenting that I demonstrated without actually talking about. And so, so thank you for your question. That that is very um, a very good question. 
so you can build that into your presentation and uh, and make it seem just a natural flow. When you build in those technical aspects of your presentation and presenting that information, uh, as long as you have it built in from the beginning, it will it will seem very natural. So just as I did today, describing those uh, those images that you saw on the screen. It, it was just a natural part of my presentation. I built it into the information and the context and the content. And and you probably didn't even notice that that was a uh, an accessibility best practice. Thank you, and Abby. Yes, I have several more questions for you. Oh, OK. OK, uh, were you done answering that question? Uh, yes, and I, of course, uh, I know that Jonathan is also going, he is our technical expert. And so if, um, you know, he can always add into that during his presentation as well. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Jonathan. Yeah. I am happy to jump into now just oh, since, wonderful. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, timely, but I did uh, everything. I just want to second everything that uh, Abby has said. But yes, I mean, in terms of the, the technical content, I mean, really, if it's something that you have a technical image like a diagram or a chart, then definitely um, it's good to either you know verbalize that if you can, or if you're just making it as a document, um, you know, provide that information in the main body of the document so that people uh, don't have to you know rely on just the alt text for an image. And uh, also, you know, in terms of the audience uh, related to this question here, you know, if you know your audience has technical knowledge of the topic that you're addressing, then, you know, that's fine to have technical content. I think everybody appreciates having it being as uh, simple as possible. But obviously, if there is, um, you know, if your audience is aware of the, the technical piece of your topic, then that's perfectly fine. So um, I did want to uh, chime in also on the column question. So the screen readers really um, have had some great advancements in the last five years even. So some of the big names are JAWS, which was what this um, demonstration video was read with. And you know, that was a five, it's a five-year-old video. So it was recorded with you know, a five-year-old version of JAWS and also uh, with Office 2013. So JAWS, has definitely made some progress over those five years, and it tries to pick up on things that aren't even you know naturally accessible. Um, we obviously want to be using you know best practice for accessibility, but I do believe that all the major screen readers, JAWS, there's one called NVDA, which stands for Non Visual Desktop Access, and even Windows Narrator, which is included now in in Windows 10. So uh, those will all read uh, you know the columns and the the standard formatting and in Office documents, so um, yeah, it should it should do that. Okay, while I have you both on, we have a few more questions. Let me know if I need to table some for later, but I'm gonna keep asking unless you tell me uh, we need to move on for time. Uh, are we going to learn how to set up the accessible document that you that you just presented? Well, that's a great question, and I'm glad uh, someone asked that. Thank you. Yes, the document that I will be demonstrating. Shortly is actually that document that you saw in there. So we'll step through how that was made accessible. Excellent, thank you. Our next question is, how do we create alt text in Microsoft products? Uh, that one we're also gonna step through. So there are some images in that document that you heard the screen reader read, and uh, we'll step through the process of actually adding that in Office. If you choose to include a video in a presentation that already has open captioning and you have selected to use live captions during the presentation, will it duplicate it on the screen? Yes, uh, it will duplicate it. So if you have uh, pre recorded captions and you embed that in PowerPoint, for example, if you are sharing your system audio in a live event like this, it will actually duplicate the captions. So um, that is something to consider. Um, now, I will say that the user can control whether or not the live captions are turned on or off, but if you're sharing content that is embedded, like a video that has captions, they uh, cannot turn that on and off typically. So uh, best practice there would be for the user, you know, just to alert the user that they can turn off their captions. I think a lot of people, if they see that the captions are 
um, on for that video, they'll probably turn off their live captions so they don't get duplicate captions. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, next question. I have heard that sentences that are entirely capitalized are harder to read because of lack of variation in capital letters than regular sentence case sentences. Is that true or do you have any information regarding this? So I've not experienced issues with the screen reader and capitalization. I think the main thing it goes off of if it's reading text is the punctuation. Now I will say that for acronyms, uh, oftentimes it won't pronounce the acronym in a way that a human would. So it can get a little tricky to get the acronym to come out the way that you want it to. For example, JAWS, and this isn't even an acronym, this is true for other words as well, but JAWS oftentimes pronounce Ohioans as OEANs. So some of those words that you know sound the same or you know, but are spelled differently, um, you know, it can get those, but if you have a word that is spelled the same but could be pronounced differently, then the screen reader, you know, is going to pick whichever one it's programmed to do. So um, that's something to watch out for. Sometimes you can kind of trick it if it's alt text by um, separating the letters, for example, if it's read as individual letters. Um, but, you know, I do think, uh, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I do think oftentimes, you know, people who use screen readers a lot are used to those quirks so they can kind of get the idea but it is something to be aware of as a content producer next question how would you advise making virtual presentations accessible for example some pre some presentations may not have text or visual content on the screen at all times well i think that's one thing that we um the tools that we use for visual presentations especially Office 365 with Microsoft Teams and Teams Live events, they do have those built in uh, accessible features such as the live closed captioning as well. Um, if if you do not have those or do not use those tools, I, I'm sure James will uh, be very happy that I said this, providing notice on your invitations is so critical so that when you have an invitation goes out like the invitation and announcement for this training we had a notice statement that stated if you uh, have a need for an accommodation or a reasonable accommodation please contact this person ahead of time and then that way you can be prepared but it's best practice to always make sure that your presentations and your content is fully accessible um, at the very beginning for your lar to impact the largest audience possible. Thank you for that, Abby. I'll, I'll just add something, uh, something real simple as well. Sometimes the request will just be to, can I get the information beforehand? And they familiarize themselves with the presentation. So for whoever asked that question, um, I, I hope that was a satisfactory answer and we're gonna get a lot more information coming up soon with Jonathan's uh, presentation. But let me um, ask uh, just, just a couple more questions, it looks like. Let's see. Should we do anything special for graphs, charts, as far as alt text goes? So I'll take that one. Yeah, so, um, and I know, I know that person said they might have missed this. Yeah, we had talked about complex graphics, and one of the things that if you do have a complex graphic, such as a chart or a diagram or an infographic, um, you know, the best practice for that is really to include the content you're trying to convey somewhere in the main document or if it's a presentation to verbalize that. So, you know, the doc, the, you know, the chart was included for some reason. There might be something you're trying to point out. So let's say it's, you know, a line chart. Maybe there's a trend line that you're trying to highlight, you know, conveying that information, the reason why that chart was included um is you know the best practice for that if it's really all of the data that you're trying to convey then there are other um ways to convey that for example you know charts oftentimes are based off of spreadsheet data so you're providing that data to the audience is always good in those cases because you know the the excel spreadsheet for example um that data can then be read by the screen reader versus the visualization of the chart. So that would be my recommendation for the more complex graphics. Thank you, Jonathan. How can you test your content to make sure it is accessible? 
So we are going to cover in the demonstration a couple tools that are embedded in Office 365 to test for accessibility. They have a great accessibility checker that has made leaps and bounds over the last five years. And uh, there's also some additions to the grammar checker that can help with clarity and um, you know, your writing style. So we'll take a look at both of those. And here's another question. And it's, it is, we found that JAWS may pick up on all columns and information, but when using the Windows built-in reading feature, it may skip over information. Is that just an issue with Windows? So the Windows narrator is definitely not as robust as some of the um, other screen readers. You know, JAWS is a commercial screen reader that's been around for a long time. Uh, NVDA uh, is actually open source software, so it's it's a bit freely available. But um, you know they both are are a little more robust than the Windows Narrator. Now I will say Windows Narrator had some huge improvements between uh, it, well huge improvements with Windows 10. Windows 10, I should say. So it actually does do a lot of things that JAWS and NVDA would do. But uh, yeah, I would not be surprised if some things don't read well. Um, my, my test with it, it did a really good job with Office documents, um, but definitely something to keep out for. Just, just because it doesn't read well with Windows Narrator doesn't necessarily mean it won't be picked up well by JAWS. Uh, again, if you're following all of the accessibility best practices, it should read pretty well with anything. Any suggestions for voiceovers for videos that are embedded in presentations that have minimal verbal cues? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. So there is uh, something called audio descriptions, which um, you know, oftentimes can be a separate video. Sometimes they're done in the context of the same video, and it sort of depends on the timing. But ideally, any sound, you know, any sounds that are um, you know, part of the video that convey meaning um, should be described. So that can be, uh, you know, I remember watching an Indiana Jones video that had audio descriptions. And uh, so they're saying, um, you know, Indiana Jones is being chased by a boulder and runs out of the cavern entrance. So it's, it's um, you know, it's a great thing to do. And like I said, I mean, whether or not that is the, the main presentation or a secondary presentation sort of depends on the timing of the content. If you have time, it's great to include as much information as you can uh, to verbalize it and also put it in the captions. Um, but if not, um, I have seen it where it's a second a second video and you can provide you know both of those. Thank you for that, Jonathan. And just let the audience know, we, we there will be additional resources and we're developing other content for not just documents, but for videos as well as, as this question just asked. So uh, we got lots of exciting things coming to make sure that we are moving forward to become a disability inclusive. Uh, another question. So will the screen readers consistently choose one way to pronounce a word with multiple uh, me meanings? For example, we live in a house versus this event is live. Uh, in my experience, it will it will pick um, whatever it will pick one. So for example, content versus content. Um, you know, I might write, you know, the content of this presentation is captioned, um, but JAWS might read it as the content of this presentation is captioned. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure the inner workings of it, how it picks one over the other, but it has been consistent in my experience with them. So it's definitely something to be aware for um, or aware of, I should say. I do think that oftentimes um, you know, you can, like I said, if you're doing alt text, you can kind of trick it to be the word that you want. And, you know, for advanced users, uh, screen readers, there's, you know, one of the things that the commercial screen readers and NVDA as well offer is the ability to script it to kind of get it to do what you want. So um, it might be possible that, you know, it, to script it to provide you, you know, um, better reading of these different types of words. I'm not aware of that, but I will just toss it out there that it may be possible that a user has configured it to do something different than the standard, um, you know, the standard experience you would receive just, you know, out of the box. So, 
Thank you for that, Jonathan. And, and, and audience, please know, we know some of these terms may not be familiar, you may not be familiar with like scripting. These are things that uh, we will learn as we continue with our disability inclusion initiatives. Uh, there's a clarification on the question about the all caps. The person asks, so if I'm visually reading a sentence, not with a screen reader, and the sentence is all caps, and I think this is a comparison, I've heard that it is hard to visually distinguish capital letters, making all caps sentences less accessible. And uh, the question is, do you have any data or information on this? Well, I, I don't have data on that. Um, it's a great question. So I do think that, you know, if you are, let's say you're convey conveying meaning by bolding text, for example, um, I do believe with the screen readers, you can get it to tell you the formatting on the screen. Uh, my experience with the standard uh, you know, standard installation, the standard settings is that it's not going to do that by default. There's quite a few settings in JAWS and the more robust screen readers. So I think you can get it to tell you, hey, you know, this is what, um, you know, the formatting is. For example, in Word, if you have a word spelled wrong, JAWS can pick up on that. It's, under, you know, it's spelled wrong because it's underlined in red, for example. But generally speaking, um, you know, Avoiding formatting as the sole purpose or the sole uh, way of conveying meaning or conveying information is not a particularly good practice because it can cause problems for uh, screen reading and assistive technology. And quite honestly, people um, you know with color blindness and you know other visual disabilities might have a hard time picking up on that as well. And I'd also like to add, uh, you may want to be careful of doing things like that because of individuals with uh, learning differences uh, such as dyslexia or dysgraphia that they may have a hard time um, distinguishing words because some people don't read words phonetically they kind of look at the shapes and kind of how the uh, the word uh, the visual look of the word so if it is all caps and in like, like those block letters it may be challenging for people with learning differences to to read those uh, those sentences that are in all caps. Yeah, excellent answer. I'm going to close out the questions with this question. And uh, Jonathan, if this is going to be included in your presentation, you can handle this how you like. Um, but the question is, I believe it says that the state is using Tableau and Power BI and other tools to show dashboard and other data visualizations. How do we make that accessible? That's a great question. So yeah, accessibility obviously extends beyond Office 365 uh, websites such as Tableau apps and things like that. Um, so really the the ability to have it be accessible depends entirely on how the app in this case or the website is programmed. So we're not getting into that today, but you know if it does export reports, um, and if it's not accessible, there are some things that we might be able to do. For example, if you can get the report in Excel format or in Word format, then you know we could add accessibility. You know by following the accessibility best practices, you could add accessibility, improve the accessibility of that. But you know, generally speaking, you know we're at the mercy of the application itself and how well it implements accessibility. So um, yeah, I do know that oftentimes with uh, apps like Tableau. And Power BI, you know, those companies will publish what's called a VPAT, which is just an acknowledgement of how accessible their application is. It'll tell you pitfalls it might have and areas where it does well. So that might be something to take a look at. So, you know, if I'm using this particular feature, it might not be accessible. Yeah, excellent, uh, Jonathan. As we continue to uh, move towards disability inclusion, another thing we will have to look at is um, what are the programs? What what are what are our platforms, and how accessible are they? So um, th there'll be more information on that as we as we move forward. Uh, one of our questions is: Are merge sales in in Excel? Uh, are merge sales in Excel always less accessible, or is there ability to add help text or something else to make it accessible? So Excel, yeah, Excel is among the Office 365 applications. Excel does have some different accessibility 
features and techniques that we need to be used. I know we didn't cover Excel in this training, but it does have uh, something called input messages that are uh, can be customized as sort of alt text for the cell. And that is something that the screener can pick up on. So through some creative use of input messages, um, you can kind of get, uh, you know, some tips and uh, that can be you know presented to the end user. Um, yeah, I mean, merge cells and things like that. Again, I mean, the screen readers can oftentimes at this point pick up on those, but generally speaking for data files, the idea is to have that be as uniform as possible. So, uh, you know, the visual presentation of it, uh, you know, in Excel particularly um, can, you know, cause problems for, uh, you know, navigation because of the merge cells and jumping around and things like that. So it's something to definitely pay attention to, you know, how this might be perceived if you are navigating only with the keyboard. Uh, another great uh, question is, what is the best way to add a checkbox under developer do? I you OK, I'm not sure. Um, maybe a, 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 I'll try this again. What is the best way to add a checkbox under developer? I use the checkbox control content to add the checkbox. And will this be accessible? So the checkbox, so the controls in Word in general, those would be used if you were creating an interactive form of some sort. So the only ones that are accessible are the legacy controls. Now, a word of caution is that they are from 1997, so they are very, very dated. Um, you know, Microsoft has um, twice updated that. There's um, a, two other sets of controls in there that you can access. But the ones that remain accessible are the legacy control. So if you're going to use a checkbox, I would recommend going with the legacy control in there. And uh, we do have, and this will be linked in the resources document, uh, training that uh, is available from the OOD website, accessible to everybody from our website on how to create interactive forms in Microsoft Word. Um, that was recorded with Office 2013, but again, because the technology is really from 1997 with the legacy controls, it still applies. So um, nowadays I do tend to kind of direct people towards using some other tool for that, particularly Adobe Acrobat, you know, with the understanding that it is another purchase because Acrobat is commercial software and you would need the full version of that. But I do think that Acrobat at this point has better accessibility controls for forms and it's just a general better experience for the end user for forums kind of across the board so i'll put that caveat in there okay here's a uh, a nice uh, comment here and a question instead of grouping objects in a powerpoint presentation i will sometimes take a snipped image of the whole group of objects and treat them as one image to which i then i apply alt text it seems to be a viable option, but anything that you know uh, could pose an accessibility issue. So would doing it that way pose an accessibility issue? That's actually a great trick. You can select all of the content. This would be, say, smart art or shapes that you've added directly in Word. You can copy that and then paste it as an image back into the document. And that works really well. It groups everything together. Same thing with PowerPoint. Let's say you had a complicated background, kind of like the one that I showed that has, you know, the puzzle pieces and each individual segment of the puzzle piece is its own graphic that can get tedious to navigate through. So that would be a good way to do that. The only issue with that is it no longer becomes editable. So if it's something that you're sharing this presentation or this Word document with other uh, creators that are going to modify it in the future. If it's been converted to an image, they can't change it. So that's the only issue that I see with that. Uh, you know, the approach that I demonstrated, um, you know, would allow somebody else to edit that grouping of content in the future. But I will say that if you are navigating that presentation with a screen reader as a creator, it will read all of the pieces of that. Now I've marked them decorative. Uh, but you can still get JAWS to find all those pieces. Um, if you are presenting and you're reading a presentation with a screen reader in presentation mode, it's only going to read the highest level. It doesn't 
get into the grouping, which is kind of nice. So, um, but yeah, it's a great question. And our last question, is there a training session aimed at using Acrobat and or Adobe products for accessibility that the state offers? If not, please consider it and or can you point me in the right direction for training on my own? There is not one that I know of that exists. Uh, some of the resources we have will point you to um, content that does handle PDF files. Um, I agree that it would be a great training as well. It's definitely a separate, uh, you know, it's definitely a separate thing from Office 365 and the approach is very different um, and it does require a full full license for Adobe Acrobat to be able to check accessibility and implement accessibility features and edit PDFs. Um, oftentimes too, if you're creating PDFs, you might be using a desktop publishing software from Adobe called InDesign. And so, yeah, I definitely think that's worth doing. This concludes the questions and answers video for creating accessible content with Office 365. The presentation, as well as the software demonstration, will be provided as separate videos. Thank you for watching.